All right. So uh, that, that we henceforth be known with children, he, Ephesians 4, 14. Tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. Speaking the truth in love may grow up in him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, making increase of the body unto itself in love. Now, we're talking about this morning how babes need to grow up, and, you know, and we all need to grow. We all need to be in a continual process of growing. Even once you reach, reach adulthood, you know, you keep growing. We always have this kind of joke about our kids, you know, uh, between, between the time they're, they're 15 and 30, their parents get really smart. And about the time they get to 30, they think, man, my mom and dad have gotten smart the last 15 years. You know? No, no, the parents, between the 15 and 30, the parents get really smart. Oh, Shannon. Shannon's back there doing a, you know, she's buttering me up. What do you want? Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. Now, um, you know, in, four, in verse 14, we find out that instability is a sign of immaturity. Um, Paul even upbraided some of the Corinthians in the Corinthian church that they were still babes after apparently being Christians for somewhere around five years. Uh, the writer of the Hebrews dealt with the same problem in his letter in Hebrews, the fifth chapter. He said, you know, that when they needed to become those who need, eat meat, they were going, going back and having to drink milk. Hallelujah. We did talk about this morning how there are those that are cunning, um, you know, tricksters, and, um, <clears throat> and so forth. And so verse 15 of this chapter encourages us that, you know, the minister should speak the truth in love and, and keep Christians from falling for the trickery or, or protecting the babes, and that we should be obedient to Christ. And one of the things we need to teach our young Christians and then we need to teach our middle Christians and our older Christians and all of our Christians is obedience. And some people hate that word. Obey, that's a four-letter word. Yeah, it is. It's a good four-letter word. Obey them with the rule over you. You know, in other words, the, the true ministers of the gospel are set in the body of Christ to help you grow, help you mature, help you come of age, help you progress. Amen? All right. So... Um, obedience to Christ and the ability to recognize, recognize religious charlatans are definite signs of Christian maturity. Christ is the source from which the ability to grow comes. He is the object of our goal or that growth. Immature Christians have a tendency to overly revere Christian leaders. Now listen, we need good leaders, but you don't, overly, you don't revere them in, in, in the place of Christ. Eight, Jesus is the head of the church. Well, Jesus said the Bible, yeah, but I'll tell you, someone says got revelation. And they got a revelation that's beyond Jesus. It's beyond anything you need. Amen. Um, sometimes, you know, we, we need to respect our Christian leaders, but, you know, you can turn that into to wor man worship. Paul even dealt with that in 1 Corinthians. Remember that? He said, you know, uh, I, some say, I'm a Paul, I'm of Apollos. He said, who is Paul? Who is Apollos? You know, uh, I say I baptize, I, I'm, I'm glad I baptized none of you except, except a couple of people. He says, for you, you, know, you know, they're nothing, I'm nothing. It's Christ Jesus we're about. Amen? So one of the things we need to do in Christian growth is always keep pointing back to the Lord. We always need to keep following the Lord. You know, Paul even said this. And you talk about mature Christian leaders. He said this, follow me as I follow the Lord. What does that mean? If I'm not following the Lord, don't follow me. Can you say amen? See, when we, maturity in the things of God means you're following after the things of God, the word of God. You're not following a man. Man can lead you astray. I am. Uh, and the man can get off. They can be good one minute and bad the next. There was a, there was a church in, in, out in Oklahoma uh, at one time was one of the happiest churches in, that, in, in Tulsa. I mean, they were going and blowing. I mean, they had people coming in by buses for conferences. I mean, and they were, they were, they were just going and going, going, going. Well, somewhere along the line, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, one thing happened. That pastor got into sin at one time and never really repented for his sin. Just kind of covered it up. And he was a single guy. And, got, and, and, and Well, we'll just leave that alone. But, yeah, he got into sin, didn't really, didn't really deal with it. Now, let me tell you something. If you're a public figure and, you're public, and your sin becomes public, you need to deal with it publicly. It needs to be dealt with publicly. You need to repent to the church, to the body. 
Well, I need to repent before God. Yeah, that, set, that gets you cleansed of the sin, but it doesn't bring restoration in your relationship with the people that were uh, affected by your ministry unless you get it right. Amen. And so you go, you go and you publicly repent, and then you get into a, a disciplinary program where there's overseers over you who are helping get, bring you into a place of restoration where, where, the, where the trust is restored. You see, you know, ministers, when they get into sin, uh, break trust with people. Unlike, you know, if a sheep gets into sin, everybody, well, we can love them, but when the minister does it, they've got that. I mean, there has to be a restoration of that trust because of their position of ministry. There's no way around it. You ha it's got to be done. And he really didn't do that. <clears throat> and then uh, it wasn't long after that, a few years after that, that he, he got into a situation where he went off to some uh, convention and Went in this, uh, a group of, of homosexuals invited him to come preach. He went in and preached, and they washed his feet, and he came back, and he started teaching that everybody's going to heaven. You know, they showed him more love than the body of Christ showed him. But, I, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. That, that, that kind of stuff is just is not true. It's not, it's not true. I don't, I don't buy it. I don't believe it. Oh, you know, they showed me more love than the Christians showed me. I, I just don't believe it. I think, you know, maybe you've got an expectation of what love is, and, you know, if somebody shows you something different and whatever, you know, and you come up with some kind of stuff, I just don't buy it that, that, that people who are not serving God, you know, uh, give you more love than Christians do. And you, got, you always got some bonehead believer. You're going to have a bonehead believer here or there. This is going to be out there. Then he got out and kept preaching, and finally got over to preaching universalism. Nobody's going to hell, everybody's going to heaven. Now, he had a 5,000 member plus church. Now, different men of God, old Roberts, different men called him and said, look, you, you're, you're, what you're preaching is wrong. You need to stop this. Well, his church starts women. See, here's what happens. If you teach your people right, even if you get off, they, get, they leave. Hello? You know, they were hungry for they loved the word, you know, as long as you're preaching. Well, his church started dwindling. <clears throat> got on television, and, and, I mean, I'm on, on a, like a secular television station. I mean, net, net, major network talking about this radical conversion he had in his, his theology. He said, he said you, can't, I, you can't find anything I'm preaching in the Bible, but I know it's true. I've got to, see, there you go. I'm convinced it's true. He admitted you couldn't find it in the Bible. Said he couldn't find it in the Bible but he was convinced he was right. Honey, if you're convinced you're right outside the word of God, you're wrong. Well, I just feel like I'm right. Feelings won't get you in. Feelings, feelings, nothing more than feelings. I forgot who wrote that or did that song. Anybody remember? Feelings, nothing more than feelings. Can't remember who did it. All right, hallelujah. Tried to forget, yeah. Bible. It's got to be the Bible. Church dwindled down to 200, had to get rid of the building, and within a year's time, he lost the whole church. Now, I don't know what he's doing today. And my, my, my desire would be, listen, you've got to keep your gifts and callings of God without repentance. Your people are called. You know, God can restore them, but I'm telling you, you know, he wouldn't have had to, he wouldn't have had to lose that whole 5,000-member church had he stayed with the Bible. You get you in trouble. That's a lot of folks to lose. I said, are you here? And it's one thing to lose 25. It's another to lose 5,000. And all because you, you were preaching something other than the Bible. Isn't that right? So we don't, we don't want to worship Christian leaders. Now, I, I got the, that 200 just hung with them as long as they could. You know? Now, Jim Jones got uh, 800 people with a drink. Kool-Aid was laced with strychnine or arsenic, whatever. I'm not sure that he did it on by willingly, but they, they followed him right down to the end. These, these cults, cults get control of people. And they use techniques uh, that control people, you know, manipulate them. Listen, you know, we shouldn't be manipulated in the body of Christ. Now listen, it's one thing to teach obedience, submission, authority. You know, not speaking against the man of God, you shouldn't, you know, just, you can just leave quietly. You don't have to go out and cause big st uh, stink. Now, if they're preaching false doctrine, you can always deal with false doctrine. I, I don't think it's speaking against a man if you, when somebody's preaching something that's wrong and you address what they're preaching, not them. 
If they're preaching false doctrine, they're preaching false doctrine. Amen? It's not, well, we've got to walk in love, brother. What they're, what they're preaching is wrong. I, I am walking in love. It's my responsibility to preach the truth. Amen? And bring correction to the teaching. You still love the person. Amen? Now, um, Christ, good Christian leaders help us grow. Um, in addition to the fact that a mature Christian will be stable and obedient when they, they spend time in the Word, um, the last passage, the last verse of, of Ephesians 4.16, shows us that the body is to grow and mature in harmony with the individual growth of the people. The body grows as believers as Christ is allowed to have his rightful place and as they do their part in the total process. Many congregations, however, have adopted the unscriptural philosophy of hiring a, a pastor or a hireling, really, to do all the work of the ministry for the congregation. It's not his job to do all the work. His job is to train you so you can do the work. That goes over big. Well, he's supposed to be doing it. No, 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 no. He's training you for you to go do it. The body, of, see, that's, that's the function of the church. The church is not just so you can come and get to feel good on Sunday morning with a feel good message or a, you know, a stirring message that tells you you're going to have money next week. You're to mature as a believer so you can go do the work of the ministry. The body of Christ is supposed to be reaching the world, not the pastors, not the evangelist. So we think, okay, we're only people say we've got to bring in an evangelist. No, you are an evangelist. You're called to go in the highways and byways and compel them to come in. That's part of growing up in Christ. That's part of becoming a mature believer is you go out and do the work of God. Um, so the word of God goes on and teaches us that as we grow in things of God, then we become suppliers to the body. Everybody say a supplier. See, it's your job to be a supplier, not just, you know, not just come in and get a taker. You're not a taker. You're supposed to be a supplier. Baby Christians will, over, uh, in the beginning, be taking more than they're giving. Um, you know, my, my uh, son is 20. Uh, he's, you know... There was a time I couldn't sit him out to cut the grass no matter what. He, couldn't, he wouldn't be able to reach it. I like, he was a little fellow for so long. It was, it was kind of funny. He stayed in the 25th percentile. We thought, man, he is going to be a shrimp. We did. You know, that, well, he's not anymore. He's not a shrimp anymore. He kind of just always. And boy, we went to the doctor that one time, and he was at 40th percentile. We thought, woo, praise the Lord. He's almost 50%. Then he moved on up. Now, for years and years and years, I had to do everything for him. See, now he can cut the grass for me. And I send him out to do it. Nathan, go cut the grass. Well, he'll whine and fuss sometimes. Amen. Parents, you know, ain't got, got kids like that? That's good to know. No surprises. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. But you know, uh, as, as we grow, I'm looking for something. That's why I'm kind of meandering around here. Hallelujah. I know it's in the Bible. I just got to find it. Hallelujah. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll get to it. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 there we go. I just didn't read far enough earlier. Um, so verse 16, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part. Now, what? According to the effectual working in every part. See, every part has to be, have the effectual working of the things of God in it so it can be a supplier. Our goal is to become suppliers in our growth. Amen. Meaning you're going to have to mature, you're going to have to develop, you're going to have to take in, you're going to have to, you know, rightly discern the word of truth, you're going to have to grow in the grace, and you're going to have to grow in the things of God. The word of God's going to have to mature you so that what? So that the effects are working in, your, in you as a part can now become a supplier to the body. And you can carry out your function. Amen? According to the effects are working in the measure of every part, making increase, increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. So our spiritual growth, our maturity, 
is so that we can become suppliers. Say, I, I'm, I am uh, maturing and becoming a supplier. God wants you to be a supplier. Say, God wants me to be a supplier. Now, there's going to be times you're going to need to be a taker. There's going to be times when you're injured spiritually or physically or whatever. There's going to be times when you need ministry. That's fine. That's when the suppliers minister and nurture. You even as an adult, you know, if an adult gets injured, you have to help them. You just don't shoot them. We don't shoot our wounded. We're not supposed to anyway. Amen? I said amen. We're, we're, we're to help our wounded, not shoot them. And then we become suppliers to the wounded. Everybody say suppliers to the wounded. We're supposed to help them. Everybody want to be a help? Who wants to be a help? All right. Well, that's your, that's your process. Now, when, we, when somebody's always come in, all they do, ever do is take. I mean, can I say something? Tithing and giving money to the church is not, is not that's supplying natural things. But, you know, there's, there's more to your growth as a Christian than just throwing money into the church. A lot more. You're to be a supplier of spiritual things. When you come, you're to bring a spiritual supply. Now, I understand this. Whether you're tithing, you know, $1 million a month or $1, or, or $1 a month, if it's 10% of what you're getting, that's, that's given the same amount. You're giving the percentage. We go on percentages. God goes on that percentage deal. A tithe is a tithe is a tithe. Okay? Now, after that, if you're giving, you know, you're giving, you know, you got money, you're giving beyond the tithe, fine. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We love it. The kingdom loves it. It's good for the church. In, in, in the natural sense, it helps fund the, fund the gospel in that sense. But, you know, you, you can be carnal as the day is long and give a lot of money. You can be mean and give money. You can be a jerk and give money. There's something, there's something I don't think anybody in here is like that, but I've I've seen some people that could be jerky and they, they give money. Well, God wants you to be more than a money giver. He wants you to be a supplier. Well, that's my gift is giving. Well, I, I, I challenge you that it's beyond just your finances. Every part of the body of Christ is to be a supplier in the body of Christ. That's your calling. So that they edify the body into the edifying of itself and love. It becomes stronger because of your supply. You, you, bring a, a, you bring to the table a spiritual supply that ministers to the body. Amen? That is, that is your purpose. You should grow in that thing. You should grow in that way. You should mature in that way. Hallelujah. The finances is what you're supposed to do. Is, you know, whether you're a baby Christian, mature Christian, an in-between Christian, you're supposed to tithe and give offerings. Day one. Hello. Okay. Um, but the Lord wants us to mature as the body, in the body of Christ. He doesn't want us to be children. Remember talking about in verse 14, no more children tossed to and fro. Look at Ephesians, I mean Romans chapter 15. Romans 15. We'll read from verse 1. We then that are strong, Ought to bear the infirmities. The infirmities does not mean sickness. It means weaknesses, shortcomings of the weak, and not to please, ooh, who? Ourselves. Amen? We that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. In other words, we're supposed to act like Jesus. We're supposed, to, we're supposed to be imitators of God's dear children. Listen to verse 6. That you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore, receive ye one another as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Now here we're supposed to become of one mind and one mouth. In other words, we're supposed to be saying the same things and thinking the same way. And how's that going to happen? <clears throat> well, the, the strong will have to bear the infirmities of the weak. Those that are weak Christians aren't mature Christians, haven't grown up Christians. Those who are strong are going to have to bear their infirmities or minister or supply to them strength. What do you mean have to supply to them strength? Share with them the word. 
minister to them in the word, be an encouragement to them in the word, help point them in the right direction through the word. Not draw them unto yourself. You don't need your own little church in the church. Amen. You need to be ministering to them and just, just sharing the Lord. Keep pointing them to the Lord. So keep pointing them to the Lord. Let them see you. Hello. Grow and mature and walk things out. You're telling them they need to be doing. Let them see you doing it. Hello. Now, you know, it's kind of hard for you to teach uh, people or to be an example of respect and to leadership and authority in the church when you're running around always calling me Ed and calling my wife Janie. No, that's just Ed and Janie. Hello? How are you going to, you're not even set, you're not supplying an example to baby Christians. Now, we, we had, you know, one of our, our, our neighbor's kids found our church about a year and a half ago, he hadn't seen us in years, he came in, and, you know, he, he, he kind of started calling us Ed and Jane, but he said, you know what? He started hearing all the other people calling us pastor. He don't call us that way anymore. He's calling us pastor and Miss Janie. You know, didn't have to say anything to him. The church, people he was around, heard them referring to us as pastor and, and Miss Janie. And, uh, you know, he picked up on that. See? But he learned from the supply of those who were living out the example of their, where they walked with God. Amen. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Those, the, the, you get around people who want to run around the church and just kind of, you know, let everybody know that they're, they're tight with me and call us by our first name. And then we hang with pastor. We don't, we don't hang with pastor. We hang with Ed and Janie. We'll, we'll talk to them about this or that. You know, what are they doing? They're setting an example before you that you can step down. So, in other words, they stop supplying and start becoming a, a deterrent to growth. Now, this is just one example. I'm not, I'm not making a big deal out of this, but it, it, <clears throat> it fits right here. I'm not going to preach a sermon on calling me pastor. That's not what I'm trying, I'm trying to say. That by your example, those who are weak will learn to grow and to do things a certain way and have respect for authority. Respect the position of, of the gift given into the body of Christ. Amen. Y'all hear you going home. Now, you'll hear me refer to people a lot of times as brother or sister, so and so. Um, and that's, that, that's, just, that's the era I came out of. You know, when we, we were growing up, we didn't call the pastor, pastor so-and-so. We called them brother so-and-so or preacher. You know, if you're, you want to get real country, they call them preacher. <clears throat> I've had people, you know, meet people and they find out who I am. And, oh, yeah, you're preacher Taylor. You know, you know that, that, that's okay. It's, it's still the term of respect. You know, uh, we always called our pastor brother, brother so-and-so. Uh, back in the church, that we, the first church we came out of, our denominational church. That's, that's what people did. But there was still, and you know what? Everybody did it. And even the older, older people in the church, we referred to them that way. We didn't call them by their first names. And we had Brother Moore in our, in our church. It was, it was an elderly man named Brother, uh, uh, J. Melvin Moore. He, he ran the, um, the, um, the mill down in Greenville. I, I can't remember the name, something mills. It was a, uh, anyway, it was one of the mills, you know, one of those factories. And they had one in Greenville. And if I used to tell me the name, I'll go, that's it, you know. And maybe, I think Cannon bought them out, but I don't, I don't remember who they were back then. But, yeah, we didn't call him, we didn't call him, uh, uh, hey, Melvin. Everybody always called him Brother Moore. And, see, I learned from other Christians who were over, older than me. When I came in, we called, we, we called him Brother Moore, Sister Rumley. You know, we always had, we, we respected those who were older in the Lord. Now, this, okay, this is just an example. It's not, the, it's not the only thing in the world that you're ever going to do. You know, I'm going to make sure everybody calls the pastor. Well, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the, the fact that you've matured or you've grown and you've, you've developed and learned to respect and that, that everything just by your bringing your supply into the church and doing those things in front of the baby, the younger Christians, they learn from it. They learn when you come to church all the time, it's important. They learn when you come to church on time, it's important. But when you're taking them out to eat afterwards and talking to them and sharing with them all your stuff, and then you don't ever come in until halfway through worship, they figure out it's okay for them. I know things happen to people. They run late things. I'm talking about regular, consistent, all the time. Or you throw a fit. Worship's too loud. And so you stay outside until worship's over, then you come in. Fit thrower. Grow up. And you're older, they see you as an older person in the church, and you're, you're out there throwing a fit, they start, they, they don't, why have I got to grow up? I mean, the old people of the church are throwing fits. 
Stop throwing fits. You're supposed to be a supply. You're supposed to be an example. You know what? I, I know some of you think, well, I could have stayed at home and I had to hear this. It's still true. See, the body of Christ is made up of people who come and they come into it, and every part has a part to play, but every part is to come to a point where they're a supplier. And you just can't run off on your own little self and cut the foot off and say, I'm going to stay over here and do my thing. Do it as if the foot gets cut off. Now, you may have to do surgery to the leg where it got cut off and stop the bleeding or whatever, but that foot will die, and it will die quickly. Why? There's no supply coming to it anymore. It's not receiving supply, and it's not returning the supply. There's no blood flow. And without that, it will die. The tissue will die. And die quickly. Well, I'm just going to go do my thing over here. Well, you're going you're to dry up. Now, if you get cut off, you'll, you'll cause damage to the whole body. The whole body's going to have to adjust because you got cut off. You separated yourself. You, you no longer receive and give supply. You've gone off on your own and you're drying up and you've hurt the whole body in, in the process. That's not what God, God wants us to grow up. Can okay? say God wants us to grow up. So, and we're to, and we're to, so here he says that we are to bear the, weak, the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Y'all say this real, say this. It is not all about me. It's not all about you. As a matter of fact, you're not supposed to be looking to please yourself. You're supposed to be honoring the Lord. You're supposed to be pleasing the Lord. You're supposed to be a lifestyle that, that honors him. Can you say amen, Shonda, hallelujah? Okay. Now, and notice that, 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 that Paul even has gone now from just individual growth, you know, where Peter sp spoke and wrote about desire to sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby, to hear in chapter 15 of Romans, and even over in Ephesians chapter 4, talking about the whole body corporately growing. Not just individual growth of you growing, but the whole body maturing. See, the whole, our church as a whole body should mature. Well, what do I need to go for? I, I got all I need. But yeah, yeah, yeah. See, that's that selfish thing where you, you no longer, you're not going to plug in and be, and, and be a supplier. You just need to be bored. Lower your shields. We will add your distinctive, biolo your, your, your biological distinctiveness to our collective. Okay? We're going to add your spiritual distinctiveness to our collective. You're going to become part of the Borg. The Christians, we're going to name our church the Borg Church. How many see Star Trek? Know who the Borg are? Who does not know who the Borg is? Do you know who the Borg is? Yeah. You never watched it. All right, well, the Borg is a cyber, cybernetic being. It's part biological, part computer, and they assimilate every race they come in contact with. They overtake them. They all become Borg, and they become part of the collective, and they all think one way. They're all one, one mind and everything. You no longer have an individuality. You become part of the collective, all right? That's, so that was my little hint at that. When we become part of the body of Christ, yeah, you, you do retain your, your, your individuality, but you're supposed to be a supplier to the, and I, I know, don't, don't get upset with me with this term, to the collective, to the whole. In your individual growth, in your individual maturity, you now become a supplier to the whole, to the whole body. And to your local congregation, you become a supplier. Amen? And so, <clears throat> Paul actually took where Peter had gone, you know, desire sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby, and began to talk about how that we are to come together corporately and supply corporately the whole body. Amen. So that one one is injured, you know, if you're by yourself and you get injured, it's not good. How many times have we seen where somebody was hiking or, or climbing or, you know, uh, you know, doing some kind of outdoor extreme sport by themselves? and they got injured or something, what happened to them? They died. Why? There was no one there to supply help. Amen. Had they been with a group or, where they could supply help, and, and if like five guys had gone out and one broke his leg, they, they could get and, and put some type of gurney together and haul them out. Amen. 
Whereas if they're by themselves, they can't, they can't get out. Uh, they're in trouble. There's nothing they can do. Yeah, but I want the extremeness of being by myself. No, you're, 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 you're part of a whole. We're a part of a whole. Amen? Where Paul says in Romans 15, 6, that, that we may be one mind and one mouth and glorify God. Amen. Now, without love, we will not grow. Did you know that? I said, did you know, did you know that? Without love, you will not grow. Ephesians 4, 18 tells us. Um, verse 17, he finishes up 16, says, therefore edifying yourself in love. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness or hardness of their heart. See, when you start walking in love, when you walk as Gentiles, which is not in love, you don't walk in love, you, you begin to hinder the growth factor. Think of everybody in the church. Every church just came in, loved God, loved people, were looking to be suppliers and not takers, doing everything they could to, to add to and not take away. I mean, what do you mean? Walking in love when somebody offended them. woo Come on now. Speaking truth in love when it wasn't good for them. When, you know, even that would hurt them. And by, you know, in other words, it would cost, it would cost them to, to be truthful about something in love. You know? But they want they to be a supplier. Always doing that. What would happen to the church as a whole? And say, everybody, you know, it's about, about me. Well, you know, if I don't get my way, I'm going to go somewhere else. And then there's always somebody raising up another place for the people to go so they can get a bunch of folks and hoping that people get offended somewhere else so they can come over with them and help them be a bunch of offended people together. You know? People build whole churches on, on stupid stuff. You know, house churches. How many house churches have been out there because we don't believe in pastors? And you know what usually is? You find out somebody got hurt in a church and, and you know, they don't like pastors because of how it was handled or whatever, so they don't believe in them anymore. So they go start house churches. Everybody gets together and they all grumble about how, you know, people that actually have churches, we had the real move of God. We're just a New Testament church. No, you're not. I said, no, you're not. You study the Bible, and the churches grew, and the churches matured, and pastors were given. Hello? As a matter of fact, you'll find that even in the house churches, when they were first starting out, they put elders in charge, not some young whippersnapper who didn't know his head from a hole in the ground. Amen. They got, you know, and they said, and they said that the elders were the double honor, I mean, of honor, especially those who labor in word and deed. In other words, it wasn't just the older people. Now it began to become a separation of the church group. You started getting people who were called and anointed of, the, of God the pastor and to run the churches. Amen. So we're to grow. We're to grow corporately. We have to walk in love. Can you say amen to walking in love? When the, you know, when the, when the power to grow, the power to grow must flow through each part of the body. Now, what happens when part of the body is injured and there's no flow through the body? It will hinder the whole body. Now, I can tell you, I told you, me and Nathan went camping in August, we, and, I, and I stuck that, that fork up my, in my foot, just impaled the top of my foot, went right up between the, uh, just above the, the, the third and fourth toe, right above it, it just went right in, impaled it right up in there. And uh, you know what? My whole body was, was hindered from functioning. I'm telling you, pain flowed to that one spot. All kinds of stuff went down there to, to work on fixing that deal. You know, my whole body, and listen, I'm going to tell, tell you what, that, it did hurt. I was hobbling around. My whole body had to stop what it was doing and take care of that one little, I mean, it's just, it's just a, it probably went about that far into the top through my, in my foot. But it was just a little bitty hole. I can't even tell you how big it is. Uh, about twice the size of a regular fork tongue. Maybe three times the size. But it just, and this pail, it pailed right up in there. We crazy glued it together and went on the river. Hallelujah. It actually did. Pour peroxide on it, put neosporin, I mean, and uh, put neosporin down it, and then crazy glued it together um, to uh, keep stuff out of it. You know, one thing, I didn't want to get in the river and have stuff getting in it, so hallelujah. But, you know, my, the whole, my whole body began to respond to that injury. Now, here, when somebody gets hurt in the church, or somebody has an injury in the church, the body responds to minister to it. What? So it can recover and get healthy again, so it can begin doing what it's supposed to be doing. 
We're supposed to get we're supposed to get to the point where we're healthy, and we quickly help those who are injured or hurt or whatever, so we can recover and everybody get back out doing what we're supposed to be doing. What's that? The work of the ministry. The corporate body says we're doing the work of the ministry. Amen. Then we get to the point that we're no longer children. We put away childish things. I say we put away childish things. First Corinthians thirteen eight. 4 through 8 talks about, you know, and he goes on after that. It says, when I was a child, I put away, you know, I, did, I, I acted like a child, but now that I'm grown, I put away childish things. Now, a lot of times when people come into the, body, come into the, you know, the what we call the word of faith, charismatic, you know, word churches or whatever, everybody gets all excited about, you know, how, much, how rich they're going to get and, you know, and all the, the gifts of the Spirit. And they're excited, you know, there's like a new toy to them. <clears throat> and you've got to let them grow through that. But there should come a point in time you realize that the prosperity is a tool to reach the nations. The gifts of the Spirit are not so you can tell everybody you prophesy and everything in church, but to be used to minister to people who, you know, the gifts of the Spirit are used to be ministered to people who have needs. And they're, they're manifest as the Spirit of God wills, not as you will anyway. Amen? Look over in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We'll stop here. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we're bond or free, we be all made to drink of into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. Now if the foot shall say, because I am not of the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where, was it, where would be the hearing? Now, the King James says it's a little weird, but it basically says, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the smelling be? But now, everybody say now, hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it has pleased him? And if we were all one member, where were the body? But now are there many members, yet but one body. But I cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of thee. Nay. Much more these members of the body, which seem to be more feeble, are necessary. Now, let's, let's face it, folks. When somebody, you know, when you're walking up and you're greeting somebody for the first time, they don't look down and see what your feet look like. They, you know, unless, unless they got a foot fetish, and that's weird. Okay? Just say it. They look you in the face. They look at your face. You know? A lot of people don't really, you know, care about your feet. They really don't want to find out what your feet are like. They don't want to smell your feet. But you know what? Without them, they may, they may be the part that, that nobody wants to talk about, look at, or whatever. I remember one time um, when, when we were living in Greenville still, we'd get our hair cut at this place. And um, uh, one of the girls there would do pedicures. And this man called up. She, she won't go do no man's foot. She, I ain't doing no man's foot. Old nasty farmer with fungus under us. She won't about to touch his feet. He ain't coming here. I, I don't do them. So now she'd do women's feet. She wouldn't do men's telling you that was just, that's just mean. Isn't that right? No, the members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. Are those members of the body which we think to be less honorable upon these which we bestow more abundant honor and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness? For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. Now let me say something. Just because you're not the preacher don't mean you're not necessary. As a matter of fact, be honest with you, uh, as the pastor, you really can't do anything without the help. You can't do it all. I've tried. And some people have let me, you know, run into it all. Well, you can't. You can't do it all. There's just no way that, that, that the pastor can do it all by himself. And he's not supposed to. Amen. Now, we put, we put a lot of demands on pastors that shouldn't be on them. I mean, and the early church did the same thing. They came grumbling because the Grecian widows were neglecting the daily ministration. And the disciples got up and said, hey, we can't stop spending time in the Word to take care of feeding people. Y'all choose out seven men full of faith in the Holy Ghost. Let them take care of it. We're going to give ourselves to the Word of God in prayer. Now, you do that today and they'll say, what do we hire you for? You hear it all the time. Congregational rule churches. What did we hire you for? And some businessman may not like, you know, they, they want to run everything. Well, you're not, you know, just because you run a business don't mean you're supposed to be running the church. 
that went over big. Oh, yeah. And he goes on verse 25, that there should be no schism in the body, but the members should have the same care one for the other. So whether one member suffer, all the members suffer, or one member is honored, all the members rejoice with that. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. And God has set some in the church. And he goes on and talks about the different ministry gifts here. Now, this is teaching us that the body of Christ is supposed it doesn't matter what, you, what part you are. I'm going to tell you, if you're a callus on the bottom of the little toe, you're over the devil. Yeah. And you'll get the same reward the rest of the body gets. Amen. Y'all hear you going home? Well, I don't want to be a callus on the bottom of the little toe. Listen, just rejoice you're in the body. Yeah. It's better to be in the body than not in the body. It's better to be a callus on the bottom of the little toe than not to be in at all. I don't believe God has calluses, but I, well, some people act like calluses. Anyway. That, that should have said, should have said that, should have. But see, each part has its role to play in the maturity and the growth. Amen? All right.